Well, hello and welcome back to part two of this special edition of Talking Europe with EU Commissioner Elisa Ferreira, who's in charge of cohesion and reforms. Commissioner, welcome back. Mm -hmm. So in part one, we were talking about disadvantaged regions, Guadeloupe, particularly the French Overseas Territory. There are disadvantaged regions closer to where we're sitting in Brussels, let's say. Uh, and I want us to just have a quick look at this extract from our own report in Romania uh, and the situation faced by the Roma uh, people. Uh, here is uh, Adrian Tudor of the RSL Civic Platform uh, for the Roma people speaking to our reporter, Luke Brown. Uh, since our uh, accession to the EU, what we can see is that uh, Roma organizations, uh, and I'm not a neurosceptic in any way, uh, but Roma organizations became service providers, stopped, um, stopped caring that much about how Roma communities are going, how they are evolving, and started uh, getting more interested into how to fund their programs. Not much has changed, but a lot of money has been poured in. So the only conclusion is that it has been poured in the wrong direction. And I'm not really sure if it is uh, willingly put in the wrong direction or if it is just a mistake that we will correct in the next, uh, in the next phase of EU. Commissioner, what do you make of that? He's saying money has been suspended, but not in the right way. Well, uh, this is a very important issue, the, the minorities uh, and some of the minorities uh, are, are in fact, uh, I mean, they, they have to be, to be treated with special care in the context of the overall programmes that we negotiate with member states. Again, the member state is the actor that is in between. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, we have got, uh, we have, have put at the European level a lot of pressure Mm. Not only in the case of Romania, but in the case also of, for instance, Slovakia, mm -hmm. of uh, a lot, I mean, uh, particularly in Eastern countries. These communities are very, very numerous, uh, but they are traditionally very excluded. Mm. And so we have, uh, we have kind of uh, forced, I, I, the word is probably too strong, but we asked these countries, in fact, to have special approaches to the development of the areas where these communities live. The problem is not uh, money, again, is the methodology, how to address it, how to involve the communities. There are very interesting, positive examples, uh, examples of integration, also with funding. Uh, I visited in particular one in, uh, in Slovenia, for instance, and uh, there are positive examples, but also it's an issue for all of us to be concerned with and to try to create an alternative future for these communities and to avoid uh, kind of mm, deciding to forget about their existence. Mm. That's what happens in a lot of countries. Now, of course, richer countries pay more to help the poorer regions in Europe catch up, but does that mean that richer EU states are getting a rough deal? Well, not quite. Our fact checker, Sophie Samai, explains. Cohesion policy. A richer country's losing out. The cohesion policy is financed by member states. Every country contributes to this European fund, some more than others, some less, depending on the size of their economy. In other words, the return on investment varies from one state to another. So is the cohesion policy unfair? The answer's a little complicated. Countries referred to as net contributors indeed give more than they receive when it comes to the funding for their regions that need it. For 2021 to 2027, nine countries fit in this category. Germany, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Austria, Finland, Sweden, Denmark and Ireland. Together, they help to improve the quality of life in countries or regions that are struggling the most, known as the net beneficiaries like Poland, Greece, Hungary or Romania. This funding in turn generates some advantages. It tends to maintain political stability, while economic growth often benefits neighbouring countries thanks to the single market. For example, the first high-speed railway in the Baltics is partially financed by this fund, but will be built by Spanish, French and German companies. 
And every year, thousands of French students go to EU-funded universities in Romania, and these students return to France with new skills. So the idea of a clear-cut list of winners and losers is largely distorted and rather false. So, Commissioner, in a European election campaign, are you expecting populist messages about we're paying too much and poor countries are not pulling their weight? The purpose is not to pay in the budget as much as you get out of it. Because if you do that, you don't, if, if the, the budget is not distribu redistributive, it doesn't make sense to have a budget. The problem is that if you have an open competitive market and if there, is lo there are lots of imbalances internally, the winner takes it all. And so you have internal migration, you have internal depopulation, you have pockets of poverty. So rebalancing growth is a precondition for the internal market to function. It's not, it's not charity. On the other hand, all the regions receive cohesion funding. The richer, reg the richer regions receive uh, or there the support is given to innovation projects, to projects with research, mm. projects that have a lot of value added. What matters is that all of us together, we develop a multipolar economy in which you have a place. Uh, to play uh, for the uh, joint wealth, so mm. to speak. So that is the philosophy behind it. One other aspect that we, we should talk about as we're, we don't have a lot of time left in this show, but the whole question of conditionality in EU funds, which is particularly relevant to uh, Poland and Hungary, to name uh, two countries which have been at loggerheads over rule of law issues with Brussels. Our reporter Luke Brown went to Felschut, the village where Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban grew up, and he also met anti-corruption activists in the capital. Budapest's Metro 3, transporting half a million passengers each day, it's the Hungarian capital's busiest line. Thanks to 418 million euros of EU funds since 2016, it's been getting a facelift. Improved wheelchair access, new lifts, even Star Wars-inspired decor, the EU's value for ordinary Hungarians. But EU funds are also a source of potential corruption. Akos Hadhazi is an independent MP and campaigns against graft. He's brought us to Feldschut, the birthplace of Hungary's prime minister and the beneficiary of multiple EU-funded projects such as this artificial lake and this tourist train that only serves two stations and only at weekends. This is the best-known example, this little train. It's an investment of two million euros, which in and of itself is reasonable. But it's a perfect example that shows an investment using European money that's completely useless. And what's more, it was all personally requested by Viktor Orban. Hadhazi wants Hungary to join the European Public Prosecutor's Office, allowing the EU power to investigate fraud. But for the Hungarian government, that's out of the question. Instead, Budapest proposed 17 corrective measures, including a new integrity authority. But some say it's toothless. The only language the Hungarian government speaks is money. So as long as this language is spoken, then the Hungarian government will be understanding. We have been waiting for this for 10 years. We have been urging and instigating the Commission to take action. So if uh, the Commission lets itself uh, be driven by Mr. Orban's uh, uh, extorting policies and the peacock dance it shows, then uh, it's just a missed opportunity and then we will have no hope for a stronger anti-corruption uh, package uh, being implemented in Hungary. Well, just a quick bit of context for our viewers on that, uh, because obviously the situation has been changing since Luke Brand filmed re that report. Budapest is now debating judicial reforms, which could unblock 13 billion euros of cohesion funds, but another 22 billion remains blocked over other issues and also 12 billion of loans and grants under the recovery and resilience facility are currently blocked. Uh, Commissioner, um, what's, your, what's your take on, let's say, that broadly speaking, on the reforms that Hungary is undertaking, uh, particularly with these so-called 27 super milestone reforms? It is work in progress. Uh, so we are in permanent dialogue uh, with Hungary and also with Poland and hoping that the problems will be solved. Let me just also make a comment in relation to this idea that there is a lot of fraud in European funding. 
this is not the case. Well, Olaf did, it, might, might disagree with you in their assessment no, a few no, years ago. That, that's their business, eh, well, Olaf. Sure. We, send, we sure. send to Olaf everything that is suspicious and we ask for reimbursement mm. of the funds when there is this confirmation of fraud. Sometimes it takes longer than we wish. But because we have got to, to, to follow legal procedures, I don't know exactly the project. I, 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 uh, it was a surprise to it. see. I just yeah. see it now. Uh, but uh, very often, and in the case of Hungary, more than one billion were reimbursed to the European budget from the previous funding. Uh, so, uh, I mean, if, if there is no conformity, we, uh, we go and we follow the issue. And if there is a suspicion of fraud, is sent to Olaf and to the other entities. Yeah. Do you have uh, but, a lot more money course, that you that you suspect still needs to be recovered in in other processes? Uh, sort of well, investigative there are, there are pro processes, processes going on all over yeah. Europe. It's not just an Hungarian yeah. issue, but yeah. of course, in the case of Poland and Hungary, at least we have got to make sure that some structural improvement is done so that progressively we have less suspicion of fraud, less corrections, less Olaf cases, uh, because in fact, we, uh, we are very attentive to this. So by the end of, of a period when we close it, uh, we have a fraud that is less than 1%, a level of, of fraud, and this fraud uh, is criminally followed. This is, I mean, a rules-based kind of institution, mm -hmm. and so we have got to abide, namely with the Charter of Fundamental Rights, to be able to be sure that we can protect taxpayers' money in the budget. Uh, a work in progress, as you say. We've covered a lot of ground, so thank you so much for being uh, on Talking Europe for both halves of this show, Commissioner Elisa Ferreira, and that's the end of this special programme on levelling up across the European Union. Thanks for joining us.